And if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. We're going to camp there today. And what's funny is, is, uh, is we, as, uh, we have this thing called strategic planning retreat every year. And uh, we plan out the, the current year and the year ahead. So we're always about a year ahead in our planning. And so we gather our campus guys together, our key uh, core team, and we, we talk about the things that we're going to preach for that year. Um, and sometimes there's usually about maybe six series that we'll all do together as, uh, as the church. So right now, Pastor Steve is preaching at Great Neck and Keno in Richmond, Bobby in, uh, in uh, North Carolina, uh, Seaboard, uh, Mark's preaching there. We're all preaching on we, the church, and our, our, whatever God speaks to us about that. But we, we plan that out last year, like at the beginning of 2021. And so, uh, so 2022 is planned for, and we were coming up with these, these sermon titles. And when we came up with the sermon title, We the Church, it brought me back. Anyone grow up in church? Like you, you grew up in church and you're all recovering? Awesome, great. And, uh, and anyone, you did not grow up in church. Like you have no church background whatsoever. And so some of you, yeah. So we're, I'm gonna teach you something. So when we came up with this title, We the Church, it reminded me of this age-old nursery rhyme that we grew up doing in church. And it's called, Here's the Church. Are you ready? So we're gonna do it together. Welcome to Wave Kids. And uh, so go ahead and clasp your fingers like this. You got it? We're going to do it together. It's happening. It's do- we're doing it right now. And, uh, and so you go, here's the church. Just repeat after me. Say, here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the doors. And this is, this is crazy. This is crazy. Flip your hands over. Here's all the people, right? Oh, my gosh. The best, right? Should we do it again? We should probably do it again. All right. So come on, Wave Kids. All right, ready? Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the doors. See all the people. Isn't that awesome? Give yourselves a hand. You did so good. Should have been a kid's pastor. Should have been a kid's pastor. Um, but uh, it's, it's a fun, interactive children's rhyme, but there is this progression in it that's fascinating to me. And it's this depiction of the church. And it describes the building first, then the decorations of the church, and then last but not least, the people. And I think in our humanity, we try to simplify things in our minds in order to understand them. If I were to go around the city of Norfolk, like not the churches of Norfolk, just like on Grammy Street Friday night with a camera and a microphone and interviewed people like, and asked people, what is the church? I think we, we would be surprised at all the answers that we would hear. Some would say, it's a place. Oh, man, it's that place on, on, on College Place down the street, that wave, that wave church. Others would say, it's a building. Some would say, it's the people. Some folks would go as far as to say, it's the place of oppression and the engine room to the patriarchy of the world. Some may say, it's, it's not about a building or a gathering, but it's about me. It's about individuality. It's about looking inwards. But what is the church? It's a powerful question beyond opinion and and presumption. Rather, who is the church? And I reckon a good place to start is the first time we see the word church in the Bible. Jesus had just fed the 4,000, not the 5,000, the 4,000. There's two different stories. And to get away from the crowds, he went to a place called Caesarea Philippi. That's fun to say. Go ahead and say it. Caesarea Philippi. Philippi. Welcome. To Caesarea Philippi. When you go to, to, on the Israel trip, you will go to Caesarea Philippi. And uh, we were supposed to go this year, and uh, it didn't happen. Israel shut its doors. And so we're going to try as hard as we can to go this year. But when we go on the Israel trip, when we all go together, we're going to go to a place called Caesarea Philippi. And it's northeast, about 30 miles um, from the Sea of Galilee. And it's in the foothills of Mount Hermon. That's where they believe that Jesus transfigured. So Jesus intentionally went away with his 12 disciples to a place that was mainly used for pagan worship. So this is what historians believe it would have looked like. Go ahead and uh, show that picture on the screen. So this is um, uh, at the bottom of Mount Hermon, and Jesus took his disciples here. Now, this is where they would worship the god Pan, the god of nature. This is probably where a lot of Caesar worship went on. 
And so this was, there were not a lot of Jews in this area. And I think Jesus intentionally went there for a reason. But this is what it looks like today. If we were to go to today, you can still see the, the ruins of those pagan temples. So Jesus is sitting with his closest disciples and I reckon in Caesarea Philippi on purpose, maybe on a hill overlooking, overlooking this, this pagan worship center, uh, the gods of this world behind him as he looks into the eyes of his disciples, these men that were so changed by his presence and his teaching, and he asked them a powerful question that I believe that we are, that he's still asking today and that we are Um, have to answer as well. And it's Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But then Jesus says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Someone say the Messiah. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, someone say this rock. rock. Maybe just throw up some rock hands. Rock, what's up? On this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, hell, will not overcome it. The question remains, what in the world is the church? We're going to try and answer that today. You ready? Come on, let's pray. Well, Jesus, we love you. We worship you. And I just pray, God, that every heart in this place is open to your Holy Spirit, open to your voice. And I pray, God, that we listen to that still, small voice of revelation, that, God, as we write this message and these words on the tablets of our hearts, that we go out into our city and change it for the cause of Christ. But above all else, that if people do not know you, God, they will leave knowing you. And if they already know you, God, they'll leave knowing you more in Jesus' name. Amen? amen. And amen. So in order for us to answer the question, we have to start at its foundation. Peter sparks something that we are living in the blessing of, of today. And again, the disciples are asked a question that is timeless. Like everyone on earth, whether Christian or not, will have to answer this question. Je- Jesus asks his dirty dozen. Who, who do they say that I am? Now, Jesus didn't ask this question because he was in a, having a midlife crisis or because he cared about the opinion of others or he needed the validation to stroke his ego. He asked this question, leading them to the most important question maybe ever asked, but he starts with who do people say that I am? Now, this was an easy question for them. A lot of the questions he asked were hard, so this one was easy. So they all piped up. Right? Oh, John the Baptist. Oh, Elijah. Some say a prophet. Some say Jeremiah. Jesus, some say you're a crazy person. I didn't say it. So, Bartholomew probably said that. It's probably never hear about Bartholomew, right? They, they say you're, you're a long haired hippie that hangs out with sheep and children. They, they, they say that you're a false prophet. Some folks say you're just some, someone we, we run to when we're trying to get out of a parking ticket or pass a test we didn't study for. I love, I love this, the, the saying, as long as there are math tests, uh, there will always be prayer in schools. Can I get an amen from somebody, right? <laughs> Jesus, if you just let me pass this test, I will serve you all the days of my life. <laughs> Anyone of you had a Scantron and you would just put C's down the middle? Anybody? If you didn't know it? Anyway. Oh, no, no, no. You're, you're the God. They say you're the God that politicians quote for the evangelical vote. No, 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 they say you're the God of the weak-minded. They say you're the, the God who, who, the one who seeks to exclude, not to include. Oh, you're the one that they, where they love your grace, but they want none of your correction. Or Jesus, they say that you're uh, uh, the one where your name is banned from city hall and public schools, but your doors are expected to be wide open when something bad happens. And Jesus hears them out, and he follows up with the most daunting question in Scripture. But who do you say that I am? I hear all that. I hear that. But no, no, no. Who do you say that I am? And I can imagine there was this silence where you could hear a pin drop among them. And there's this, this, almost this awkward pause. And then 
you know, that like a siren in the dead of night, Peter speaks up, and all the other disciples are pumped, right, because they know Peter says dumb things and Jesus is about to elbow drop. We all like when other people get in trouble, right? You know what I mean? So they couldn't wait. They're like, yes, thank you, God. Peter's speaking. Peter speaks up, and he has a revelation that would be talked about for the remainder of time. And that this Jesus is more than just a national reformer, more than a miracle worker or a prophet. No, he says, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, the term Messiah comes from the Hebrew word Meshiach. You got to spit a lot when you're Jewish, right? Meaning, Meaning chosen one or anointed one. The Greek equivalent is the word Christos or the English Christ. Christ was not Jesus' last name. You know that, right? It wasn't like Christ, comma, Jesus. <laughs> the name Jesus Christ is the same as saying and declaring Jesus the Messiah. The, the Old Testament prophesied about this deliverer chosen by God to redeem Israel. The Jews of Jesus' day had their own idea of who that Messiah would be. And in their minds, the Messiah was going to be this king that would redeem Israel by kicking out the Romans and establishing an earthly kingdom. But we know that God had other plans. So when Peter declares, like this is a big deal for Peter to admit that this man is the one that we've been waiting for. God, you've been silent for 400 years, but this is the man that breaks the silence. It wasn't until after Jesus' resurrection that his disciples finally begin to understand what the prophecies in the Old Testament really meant, that the Messiah was anointed to first deliver his people spiritually, that is to redeem us from sin. And he accomplished that by dying on the cross, raising from the dead, defeating death, taking our place, and giving us this gift of salvation. Then later, the Messiah would deliver his people physically, when he sets up his kingdom on earth called the church. Someone say the church. So my first thought is this. The foundation of who we are, the foundation of who we are, is centered on the truth that Jesus is who he says he is. So when we say we are the church, there is this this foundation that we set that, no, no, Jesus is the Messiah. That is our foundation. Anything uh, uh, different or off route from that crumbles. Our entire religion (laughs) is set on the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, that he did die, that he did raise from the dead, so that we may have life and have it to the full. Amen? Amen. If anything off, off that, off kilter, the church falls apart. You know, I, I, uh, <laughs> I had this friend, and Alyssa and I would, would uh, hang out with his family a lot. And one, one day I went over his house, and, uh, and I kind of noticed, like, there was, like, I, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me because I was looking at his house, but it looked like he was leaning a bit. And so we go in, and the dining room was fine, the living room was fine, but you go into the kitchen, and it was almost slanted. Like, you could, you could literally sit on it and slide down it. And uh, it was super awkward, and he didn't say anything about it. And I was just like, uh, so finally, you know, there's a bunch of people there. I was like, hey, dude, what's up with your kitchen? <laughs> like, it's, 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 are you making, like, a McDonald's play place in here? Like, I don't, like, they're, they're, like you're, you could slide down. And so we go outside. It was a barbecue, and we're, the, the fellows are cooking outside. And I, I can notice, like, his house, the left side of his house was on Jack's. Like, they had to, to jack it up. And so they were, he was, I, was, I asked him about it. Dude, what's wrong with your house? He's like, you're not going to believe this. But when we bought the house, the inspector missed the fact that our foundation was faulty. There are cracks in our foundation. So our house is actually starting to lean um, because it's, it's going into the ground. And I was like, what? I was like, I didn't even think that was a thing. And he goes, but if we don't take care of it, Jared, our house will fall apart. Like, the left side of our house will fall uh, into, can you imagine? And uh, just every time you go in your kitchen, you're like, Jesus, I'm just walking in faith, God, Lord, you know? But it, it's, a, it's a beautiful picture. And I think that even in ancient times when, when 
they're, they're using this analogy. It's a beautiful analogy. The foundation of we, the church, is that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So, see, Roman Catholics get this wrong. They, they believe that Peter was the rock the church would be built on, claiming him to be the first pope. No, 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 no. It was a revelation that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is God in flesh, and that he would redeem humanity. That is the rock on which the church is built. Without this revelation, the church falls apart. Amen? It's, it's not a church without that revelation. In fact, when we were, uh, we were looking for buildings, um, when we were still in the Granby Theater, and one of the first buildings we looked at was this old Presbyterian church. At least, it, it, historically, it was Presbyterian. It was one of the oldest churches in Norfolk, built, I think, in the early 1800s. And um, it, uh, it, it, like, when we walked, it had this, like, five to 600-seat auditorium. It was beautiful. And Alyssa and I were, were walking through it, and we just kind of, we fell in love with it. And we just thought, man, wouldn't it be cool if we took on this, this old, like, kind of beaten down church, and we revived it and, and kept it in the kingdom. And so uh, it ended up not working out because it was way too much money. And there was, they were trying to sell it for way too much money. And the, uh, they had no HVAC. Can you imagine? Y'all, anyone grow up in church just sweating? Right, and you had the fans. Remember those? That's me. I had the fans in church, and when it was cold, it was like ice cold. We were like, we live in the 21st century. We're we're, we're gonna have to spend a whole lot of money, uh, more money than we bought the building for to to renovate this thing. And out of the wisdom of Pastor Steve and the building team, they're like, we're gonna pass. But while we were walking through it, I remember walking with Pastor Mark, and I see this picture of Jesus on the wall. I'm like, that's a nice picture. It's Jesus. But then the next picture was a picture of Buddha. I was like, okay, kind of chunky, but nice guy, probably nice guy, right? And then I see a, a picture of Hindu Krishna, the next picture. And I'm going, all right, something's not right here, right? And, uh, and I see all this paraphernalia that says that we accept all religions and all gods and all people and all that stuff. And, and, uh, and, uh, and so I look at Mark, our, our executive pastor who's walking with us. I said, Mark, what is all this? He goes, you never heard of this, this type of church before? And I was like, no. And he goes, oh, man, these people were universalists before they were universalism. Like this, it's, it's this, this thing called the Unitarian Church, right? And I was, I, it was, this was back in the day. I, I had no, I never heard of this before. I didn't know this thing was real. And, uh, and uh, which makes it not a church at all. Like, they, they, they claim to be Christians, but their foundation is rubble in the fact that they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of the living God. I was wondering why my conversations with the pastor were so awkward, right? Like, I'm walking around the building like, hey, man, like, wouldn't this be great if we bought this and we kept it in the kingdom? And he was like, what kingdom are you talking about? I was like, excuse me? The, to the church of Jesus Christ, that's what I'm talking about. He just had, was going right over his head. And I realized he wasn't a pastor at all. And there's this, there's this, 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 and listen, we love them. There's grace for them. I hope they have a revelation of who Jesus really is. But, but and in fact, they were saying that they were, they were selling the building because they were just too packed. This is a 500, 600 seat auditorium. I was like, dang, packed. So I sent somebody to check it out to spy out the promised land, right? <laughs> to, ch- to check it out, to see like how we would do church if we, if we ended up buying the building. And they were like, Sir, there's 10 people there. There's, there's nobody there. Their, their, their foundation is faulty. Yeah. Secularism does not work for the human soul. Yeah. It just doesn't. That's why these, these old but new ideas come up and they, fall, they just fall apart. Amen? And so I... Uh, <laughs> There's this, there's this movement within our culture that's starting to creep inside of the church, and it's taking these old ideas and repackaging them, wrapping them up, putting a nice red bow on them, but really, they're just old, dusty, washed-up ways of thinking that have been dealt with centuries ago. And it, it's, it's the idea, and if I could boil them down to anything, if I could boil it down to, like, the simplest form, it's the idea that God isn't as loving as me. If I, if I could boil it down to a the God of the Bible is not as loving as me. I just love people way more, right? Why can't we just accept all gods, all religions, all ideas? Why does Jesus 
have to be the only way? And I understand the question. It's a deep question and one that we have to wrestle with. Why is Jesus the only way? Why, why can't there be other ways? In fact, I got into a conversation with uh, a new Christian, and, um, and he had no church background whatsoever. He asked me, one time he asked me, he's like, hey, man, I see, like, on signs, there's, like, Baptist and Methodist and Lutheran, and there's not one on our sign. And I was like, oh, well, we're not an denominational. He's like, wait, so there's levels to this? Like, is, is Baptist level one, and then Methodist is level two, and then we're like level 18? I'm like, yes. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, there's no levels. They're, they're, it's just doctrine. We, we, we might disagree on mostly little things. Um, but, but, yeah, there's, he had no church background whatsoever. And so he would ask me all of these deep questions. And this is a guy who was older in years. He... Um, was uber successful in his field and uh, had seen great success to the world standards. And then he comes into church and he's like, I need Jesus. And he gives his life to Jesus, but he has all of these questions. And they were so deep that there were some times where I like, had to either make something up or, uh, or go, I have no idea. Let me, let's come back. Let me research it and come back to you and figure, I don't even know what I believe that, that question, you know? And, uh, and he loved everything about the church until I preached this message called to save yourself. And the message, I guess the, the, the focal point of the message is the idea that we cannot save ourselves by the way that we behave. Like salvation is a gift from God. Uh, it, it comes, our behavior comes from the revelation of our, our salvation, not the other way around. And I had this, this thought, this, this, I, this uh, the, the verse from John 14, 6, where Jesus, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Yeah. Jesus is, is drawing a line in the sand, a boundary, and saying, no one goes to paradise except through me. No one goes in, in the presence of God except through me. In fact, you can't go into the presence of God because you're sinful. You cannot go until you go through me. And so he draws that line, and, and I said that, and I said, I had this, like, good line where people stood up and clapped, and I was like, Buddha never saved a marriage, and, you know, Muhammad never raised from the dead, and I got real Pentecostal with it, right? <laughs> Everyone stood up and clapped. He did not. He was real upset. And so afterwards, he said, hey, man, uh, usually he's like, oh, my gosh, I loved your message. I have this question. He was like, hey, man, we need coffee this week. And, uh, and I was like, all right, cool. Um, it's funny, like, I said this in the last service. Why do pastors always have to have coffees with people? Why can't we have a hot dog or, like, a cheeseburger? Or why is it always, is coffee, does coffee make you feel better about yourself? Like, wait, like I, anyway. Um, every time I go into a coffee shop, it's just all these pastors meeting with people, people crying at the table. I'm just like, I'm like, dear Lord. The Holy Spirit is in coffee shops now. It's not even here. It's in the coffee shop. Let's all go to a coffee shop. Let's go to a latte. Let's figure it out. Where was I? But anyway, he says, he says, he said, Pastor, I hear all that, but I have Muslim friends and I have Buddhist friends and I have atheist friends who I love and care for and who add to my life. Are you saying that they're wrong? Are you, are you saying that, that what you believe is right and what they believe is wrong? How can you say that? He goes, that, that's your truth, but it's not their truth. And with all the love in my heart, I could tell that this was the first time that the word of God was disrupting the way that he saw the world. In, in church, I know exactly what it means to read the Bible and have to wrestle with its truth. Like, God, why would you put this in here? Love our enemies. Have you seen my enemies? They're the worst. Right? And I've been hearing this term more and more over the last few years that just live your truth, girl. Hey, 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 bro, live, live your truth. Your truth. If everything is true, nothing is true. Do we realize that? Truth is not subjective. Either it is true or it isn't. And I want to live my life both in spirit and in truth. 
And my answer to him was, do you, hey, first of all, do you think I live under a rock? I live in the city of Norfolk. I, I, I have Muslim friends and Buddhist friends and atheist friends as well. Like I'm sitting down with you, right? You're, you're walking this journey. We're all walking this journey together. I have, I have plenty of friends. There, there's a local imam of a mosque in Norfolk. We serve on the same city board. He's my friend. He's nicer to me than some pastors, right? I love him, but I zealously disagree with the way that he sees the world. I, I have a family member who is a yoga instructor and likes to get all creepy with their third eye. And, and I, I think the way they see the world is silly, but I love them. We have the most interesting conversations at Thanksgiving, right? My doctor is an atheist, and he's really good at healing my body physically, but I'm not taking any advice from him spiritually, right? And, and he said, well, pastor, if I don't believe that Jesus is the only way to God, should I stop coming to church? I thought it was a great question. Like, I'd rather have this conversation before there are people coming here <laughs> for five years and just believing that Jesus isn't the Messiah, right? So, so he's like, he's trying, I, I loved it. He was trying to draw a line in his own heart. And he said, should I stop coming to church? And I said, listen, bro, we're not a cult. You can come and go as you please. But if you can answer this question, is it possible for me to love you but wholeheartedly disagree with the way that you see the world? And he just kind of sat there for a second. And I said, you don't have to answer the question. If you can answer yes, then your journey with God in the church is not over. The decision you made to follow Jesus a few months ago, did you believe that was real? Like you, you felt the tangible love of God. Nothing has changed from that. What is changing is the word of God is starting to confront you and it leaves us with choices to make. And some of them are hard. Either I am going to follow this Jesus or I'm going to make my own way. I cannot do both. Either, either Jesus is the Messiah or he's a liar. So either I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow this man or I'm not. Either he is not God or he is the son of the living God because it is the foundation of who we are. We, the church. What I'm discovering about those deconstructing their faith, and if you're new to church, you probably never heard that before, but in the Christian realm, it's super popular. And, and deconstruct, if I could, if it's super, it gets like super deep, but deconstructing means to burn their religion to the ground and then try to rebuild it themselves, right? And to construct their own idea of a savior and the foundation being themselves, which over time doesn't last and it only leads to more hurt and pain and confusion. And those deconstructing, not all of them, but most of them that I've been talking with over the last few months, they didn't know what they believed in the first, first place. If I asked them what the church is, man, they would flounder. They would name somebody, a place. Church, this is our fund foundation, that Jesus is who he says that he is. That is our foundation. Second thought is this. Jesus will build his church. Jesus will build his church. Peter has this revelation that Jesus is the Messiah, and he acknowledges his deity, which is a big deal. Then Jesus says, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. This is the first time in all of scripture we see the word church. And Jesus uses this ancient Greek word called ecclesia. Everyone say ecclesia. Now Jesus uses this word strategically and prophetically because it had no religious context or baggage. The Jewish men hearing this would have been like, that's a Greek word. That, that, they wouldn't have attached religion to it at all. But little did they know that these 12 disciples would spend the rest of their lives establishing this ecclesia, and they would die for this church. Ecclesia means gathering or group. But more than that, it means called out ones. That's what ecclesia means. This isn't just a gathering of people, but Jesus is building, what he's building is a gathering of the called. A gathering of people on mission to see the gospel, the good news of Jesus spread across the, the earth. Ecclesia doesn't mean a building or just an event. When Jesus says, I am building my ecclesia, it doesn't mean a place. He's building you and I. I want you to write this down. We just don't go to church. We are the church. 
We must know this and define it and understand it and wrestle with it. Let it be written on the tablets of our hearts because we are not uh, uh, defined by a building or a place or an event. Strip all that away and the church of Jesus Christ will be strong. In fact, we thrive in persecution. We get bigger in persecution. We, we have this, this building can burn to the ground and the church will be just fine. Now, don't get any ideas. We, <laughs> right? Like this, this, we believe for this place. <laughs> Please don't burn it down. You know what's fascinating is I can't find a single verse that says Jesus is going to build me. That hurt, didn't it, when I said it? Oh, it doesn't say Jesus will ever build me individually or separately. Jesus says, I will build my church, you and I, collectively. Individual calling is real and important, but it is a part of a bigger picture that we cannot afford to miss. I want you to write this down. God has called us individually to build us collectively. There are places that you have influence in that I don't. And and God has, has called you to be a light in that place, not just for you, to build your name, your brand, your platform, but to build and to grow the church. Isn't that amazing that God would use you as a part of building his church. The, the Bible describes the church as the body of Christ and, and the head of the church being Jesus. It also describes the church as the bride of Christ. It's beautiful imagery. To say that you love Jesus but can't stand the church, it's like going up to somebody's wife, right? And say, uh, and say hey, I love your face, but your body now, say that to my wife, and you better bob and weave, because the right hook is coming. Can I get an amen from somebody, right? <laughs> well, ask for, ask for forgiveness later, right? Like, and listen, I understand that the church is flawed, right, and its leaders are flawed. But anyone who thinks they can become a, a Christian absent of the love for the church doesn't know anything about the God they claim to serve. To be a Christian is to love what Jesus loves. That's what it is. Amen? And, and if, if you only knew some of the deepest, darkest things that we've had to pass for people through, when it comes to the church, it is messy. The church is flawed because you and I are in it. But here is the good news. Here's the good news. The church isn't built on you or I. It's built on the truth that Jesus is the Messiah and the son of the living God. All the pressure comes off. And listen, he will build his church with or without me. (laughs) And, And when we start to think like, oh man, like Norfolk will fall apart without me. It's not me who builds, it's Jesus who builds. He allows me to steward, amen? You know, what's funny is, is when all this, the, the pandemic started to happen and all this, um, I never thought in a million years we would miss Easter. Never thought. Like, do you all remember back in 2020? Like, we thought this is, we're going to slow down the curve for three weeks, right? That's what, we back to normal in four weeks. This isn't real, right? It's, it's, and when we miss Easter, I was like, Lord, you're coming quickly. You're going to be here soon, right? As if plagues haven't hit our earth before, right? And so um, we were, didn't have church for 14 weeks. And the first Sunday back, I remember look, like we go from three-pack services to, to two maybe people, kind of people showed up. <laughs> you know, like the first Sunday, Father's Day in 2020, we were like, where did everyone go, <laughs> Right? And for us, it was up in the air for everybody. We were trying to figure out, like, is it, is it safe? Is it not? Are we all going to die? And, and, I, and I was super discouraged after that first Sunday. And I remember calling Pastor Steve, and, I, you know, we sent him reports. And, and he's like, oh, man, you had a great Sunday. And I was like, did we? <laughs> no, we didn't. It's the worst. And he was like, Jared, it's never about the crowd. Because Jesus will build his church. Just stay obedient to the voice of the Holy Spirit. I will never forget that. Amen? Amen. We build the church 
together. But at the end of the day, Jesus is going to build his church. The church belongs to him. The church, he's going to build his church, but the church also belongs to him. Verse 18, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The church belongs to no one but Jesus. And uh, <laughs> when I was in middle school, I went through like a punk rock phase. Anyone else? No effects. Just, uh <laughs> oh yeah, amen. One punk rocker in here. Um, just trying to think of all the bands I probably shouldn't say. Uh, Operation Ivy, just all of these like punk rock, punk rock bands. MXPX doesn't count, even though they're Christian. Um, and that was a joke for punk rockers, but there's no one in here that's punk rock, so. I thought that would a joke would hit way much, way better. Um, but uh, but I, I went through this punk rock phase. My poor mom had a mohawk, had like studded belt. I was in a band. I was a lead singer in a band. I played the guitar. It was awful. It was the band was awful. Um, I'm not going to tell you the name of the band. It was the Upper Class Low Life. That was our band. <laughs> it's a punk rock band. It was awesome. We go to battle the bands. We'd lose. Uh, and I remember um, there was a popular show for my generation. I think every adolescent male grew up on this show, and it's another name for a donkey. And a bunch of friends would get together and uh, hurt themselves on film. And, uh, and so this was before cell phones, thank God. And we would have camcorders, and we would film ourselves doing silly things, jumping off of roofs and skateboarding into thorn bushes and all of that stuff, right? We had, uh, every time we saw a sh shopping cart, we could not get inside of it and throw each other off something. And so we would go in the back, we would skateboard in the back of this church. It's a Baptist church. And uh, shout out to my Baptists. And they were, uh, they, the, the pastor could not stand us. And we were punks. Like we would go and skateboard, make noise. He would come out there, you can't skate here. And we would run away. They would steal our skateboard sometimes. And, and uh, we would run circles around the skateboard around them and just like really just punks. And, uh, <clears throat> and one time there was a port, they were doing renovations and there was a porter potty outside. We thought it would be funny if we put one of our friends in it and then pushed it over, right? <laughs> so, so we're doing that. We're pushing, we're trying to push, we're, and we're young, we're not strong. We're like trying to push this porter potty over. We're laughing and the pastor comes out hot, right? Just so mad. And he's like, he's like, you get out. And he had this country accent. He's like, you get out of here. I told you to stop skateboarding. In here. And we're like, and we were just having a ball making him mad. So we were skateboarding around him, and he was like, we're like, well, why? <laughs> why can't we? It's a free country. Why? And he was like, because it's my church, my parking lot. That's my porter potty. And one of my friends in the back said, isn't it the Lord's? <laughs> His head was about to explode right? Fast forward 15 years, yo boy becomes a pastor, right? We get a building, I'm writing my sermon in the back, and I hear this bang, and this bang, this like, and I'm like, dude, and I'm like, at the very end of my, I'm almost done with it, I'm in a groove, and I'm like, oh, I'm almost done, I just want to get home, I've been sitting in there for like six hours, and so I hear this bang, and I can't take it anymore, so I go outside, and it's like seven to ten middle school boys skateboarding. And there's this lip. If you're a skateboarder in Norfolk, there's this lip in the back of our church that's been popular for like years. Skateboarders like to pop off of it and do tricks and stuff like that and film themselves. And they always take something, a part of the building, and putting it over that lip so they can the, the, uh, just ollie over or whatever. And so I'm like, I'm like I can see I, the, the deja vu hasn't hit me yet. And so I'm like, hey, yo. You can't skate here. And they all look at me. And one of the kids goes, why? <laughs> and I was like, because it's my parking lot, my church. Like, Isn't it the Lord's? Right? That didn't happen. That didn't happen. But 
I was like, hey, guys, you can't skate here. And they were like, why? And I could just see this playing. I'm like, I am them. Look what I've become. What's wrong with me? I've sold out, right? I'm a poser. <laughs> and so I said, I said, all right, dude, if you can do a tray flip, which we called it a 360 shove it back in the day. I was like, if you can do a tray flip off that lip right now, I'll let you have 10 more minutes. This joker hit that tray flip like it was nothing. And I was like, dang it. And I was like, 10 minutes, I'm coming back out here. And while I was walking away, one of the kids, kids goes, thanks, Pastor Jared. They go to our church. I was like, what the heck, man? Get these grommets out of here. Gosh. But we weren't wrong. It is Jesus' church, right? Now, now this is Jesus' church, and you can try and pull that card, right, and keep parking here when you're not supposed to, right? Because it doesn't belong to you, pastor, belongs to Jesus, and I'm a part of this church. Well, Pastor Steve is called to shepherd it. I'm called to steward it. And you can park here without permission if you want to, but just like God teleported Philip, your car is going to teleport to Jack's towing yard. Amen? <laughs> if you don't have permission. Can I get an amen from somebody? Now, the church belongs to Jesus. The bank can come on up. The church belongs to Jesus. And this is why I, I'm so careful about the way that I talk about the church. Because even me, like, I, get, I can get to the point where I've seen so much in church life and people are messy that I can start talking bad about the church. And I, I will never throw mud on the bride of Christ. The world will do that for us, right? I'm not talking about holding leaders accountable or, or, or abuse or sin because there are times when we need to do that, Amen but it is becoming popular and trendy to bash the church of Jesus Christ. In my own humanity, I would, I would see people bash the church and I used to get so angry, especially if I knew like the truth behind their story. You know, I'm like, oh my gosh, they're lying, right? But now as I've gotten older, um, I get sad. Uh, because when you, when you close your eyes and you think about the church, what do you see? Like if, uh, if I'm thinking about the church, do I see the, the two or three people that I can't stand? If, if that's what you see, then your heart has deceived you. When I think of the church, I see Jesus at the helm. I see him at the center in, in, a, in a gathering of imperfect saints bowing to his leadership and his lordship. When you throw mud on the church, you think you're getting back at the people that you felt wronged you, but really, you're breaking the heart of Jesus. And the consequences far outweigh the temporary satisfaction that comes with sticking it to the person that you wanted to offend. Amen? Because the fourth thought is this. The church is the one place that the devil can never overcome. He says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but the Holy Spirit, the Father in heaven, gave this to you. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not be able to overcome it. The devil loves an isolated Christian because he can get you, but he can't get us. Amen? Jesus offered a promise in that, that the forces of death and darkness can't prevail against or conquer the church. And next week, I'm gonna talk about the difference between local and global church. And I wanna talk about what the church is and what it, it isn't. I think that'll be fun to talk about. Like, is the church meant to serve me? Is the church, what is the, what is the church meant to do? I want to answer some of those questions in the next two weeks. But what is the church? It is a gathering of men and women worshiping a God who is who he says he is. We the church. She is flawed and imperfect yet beautiful and called to bring heaven to earth. Amen. Receive the word today. Is that okay? With every head bowed and every eye closed, can I tell you that the church, our church, the church exists 
to get heaven to party. It says in the Bible that heaven rejoices over one lost person coming home than over 99 righteous. It means that when someone has the revelation that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is who he says he is, and people give their lives to him, heaven rejoices because it's one less soul in hell and one more in the Lamb's book of life. And if you're here today and you're far away from God, I wanna pray with you and for you. Maybe you, you wandered into this place, you saw the sign, you're going to Urban Outfitters or Bonchon, you saw Wave Church, you're like, I'll check it out. Or maybe you Googled cool churches in the area, maybe you're in the military. Maybe someone invited you and just so they would stop inviting you, you came. Can I tell you that the invite's cool, the Google sesh is cool, but I believe that your journey in life led you here for this moment because God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And it begins with that foundation. Jesus, you are the Messiah. And if you're here today, I'd love to pray with you and for you. If you're like, Pastor, that's me. I need to get right with God. If that's you, I want to pray for you. I'm not going to call you to the front. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to know who to include in this prayer. On the count of three, I want you to lift your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it. You lift it. And then once I see it, you can put it right back down. But friend, this moment, it's for you. On the count of three. Come on. Come on. There are hearts ready to be saved. On the count of three. One, two, three. Lift it high enough and long enough for me to see it. Beautiful. I see those hands. Yes, 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 yes. I see that hand. Awesome. You can go ahead and put those hands down. Is there anybody else? Come on, lift it. High enough and long enough for me to see. Just a few seconds longer. God loves you. Beautiful. I was waiting for that hand. Now that's what I see. Is there anybody else? I see that hand. Awesome. You can go ahead and put your hands down. And just with that attitude of prayer, every head bowed, every eye closed, we'll all say this prayer together, and I promise you it's not the words but it's the heart behind them that the Holy Spirit takes heed to. And this is saying, God, I, I follow you. And you don't have to come perfect. You can come exactly as you are. But what I love about the God that we serve is he doesn't leave us that way. It's a journey called the Christian walk. We'll all say this together. Say, today, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. You died for me. And you rose again to give me a future, to give me a hope. I am now a Christian. I am now set free. And from this day forward, I will follow you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.